Hi everyone, hey, thank you so much for joining me today. Whether you're connecting on Facebook or YouTube, I appreciate it so much. And um, I would appreciate if you just, you know, give me a little indication, a little thumbs up or something, letting me know that you stopped by would be an encouragement to me. And I, I would be encouraged to pray for you this Thanksgiving season. That's right, Sunday before Thanksgiving, uh, here we are. And um, it's kind of ironic, isn't it, a little bit, that, you know, here we are in the middle of this pandemic, and yet um, at the same time we're approaching Thanksgiving. Are you feeling overwhelmed um, just feel like you know you've just are done with this <laughs> I know I kind of feel that way and I heard somebody say that I just said in the middle of a pandemic I think we should stop saying in the middle of a pandemic because I if I do the math on it if we're in the middle of it what it's like August that this thing will you know that we'll be getting over this um, I'm hoping and praying that you know that things will change and that we'll be able to get together and be together but um, I'm praying for you and I hope that you are hanging in there I know that before this year, before 2020, whenever I'd ask somebody, hey, how you doing? Nine times out of 10, people would say, oh, busy. I'm just, I'm so busy. Um, and I probably am guilty of saying that too. But if I say that to you now, um, there are people who would say, yeah, I'm busier than I've ever been. I've heard people say that. I've also heard people say, I'm not nearly as busy as I'd like to be. Um, and here we are again, ironic, pandemic and Thanksgiving week. But um, but the truth is, is that I want us to talk about, because it's Thanksgiving season, I want us to talk about something that people think the Bible says, something something think people think Jesus may have said or God may have said that he didn't say. And I want us to take a look at this because I think the fact that God didn't say this is going to be an encouragement to you. And I'll explain that in just a moment. But before I do that, I want to read a verse that is especially timely for thanks, the Thanksgiving season. And I think it's especially fitting for all of us here in 2020 in a pandemic. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, it says, Give thanks in all circumstances. Yes, even in a pandemic. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Some of you have been going through horrible circumstances. Um, and I am really hoping, again, that this message will be an encouragement to you and a help to you. Think about it. Even without a pandemic, doesn't it seem like we're either always going into, in the middle of, or coming out of some kind of crisis or difficulty? And that's with even without a pandemic. Um, and sometimes we're doing all three at the same time, you know, going into, in the middle of, and coming out of a problem or a hardship. During this crisis, this pandemic, I mean, some of you have really taken a hit financially. Um, some of you, and here it is coming on Thanksgiving and Christmas, and I know that's especially hard. Uh, maybe you or maybe a family member or somebody you really love, you have a friend, has gotten a bad report from the doctor. Um, for others, maybe the, the tension of all of this being cooped up in this pandemic has really been a strain on your family or on other relationships. Others would say, what relationships? You know, all I can do is, you know, sit in my single house and eat my single meals and watch my single television, you know, wondering what other single people are doing and what they're eating in their single house and watching their single television and just say, you've just had it. And that loneliness just seems to really have a grip on you. Maybe in your job situation, things have drastically changed. Maybe it doesn't look anything like it once did. Maybe you've lost it completely. Um, Maybe you're battling depression. Maybe you're battling just the emotion, the weight of all this. And it just seems like this pandemic, it just gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And, and, and then, and maybe you haven't had this, but then maybe some well-meaning Christian comes along and they give their kind of cliche advice. And of course, you don't have to be a Christian to give cliche advice. But, you know, uh, you know, people say things like, well, you know, when God closes a door, he opens a window. I don't even know what that means. Um, you know, God, when God closes a door, he opens a window. I mean, what if you're on the 12th floor and he opens a window? I don't know. Don't, don't jump, right? Uh, you know, I don't know. Or, or, you know, this one. God helps those who help themselves. God, you know what? God never said that. Jesus never said that because, you know, he knows, Jesus knows that there are times when we can't help ourselves. In fact, we're going to talk about that in, in a little bit. And today we're going to highlight a, a common misquote, a common thought, and, uh, you know, you can see it on refrigerator doors and bumper stickers and greeting cards. But sometimes well-meaning people will say, hey, you're going to get through this. You're going to make it. Remember, God never gives us more than we can handle. The reality is, Jesus never said that. 
God never said that. that I, I know where they get it, and it's based on a very powerful verse, and I'll share it with you, but but um, people kind of take a verse and they really misuse it and kind of twist a little bit. And they don't do it intentionally, I don't think, but this very powerful verse is in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and it says this, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. See, Paul was talking about temptation there. And he's just saying, hey, temptation is normal. Everybody struggles with it. Everyone goes through it. And God's not going to give you more temptation than you can handle. And, and here's why. Because he also provides ways of escape. He's faithful. And he provides various ways of escape. You might say, what kind of ways of escape? Well, some of them might be um, avoiding, avoiding the temptation a- a- at all. You know, just avoiding that situation. There's a verse in the Bible that says, make no provision for the flesh. So, hey, if you've got a, you know, if you've been an alcoholic, don't walk into a bar, right? <laughs> you know that. Avoid situations like that. Also, it says, you know, the Bible says to be on your guard and pray. That's another way of escape. Jesus told the disciples, he said, you know, he said, watch and pray that you don't fall into temptation. Um, some of the some of this can be done just by submitting to God, you know, by by prayer and by by resisting. In fact, James, the book of James, James 4:17 says, you know, to submit ourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from us. Um, another way is to get encouragement from other people. That's another way of escape. You know, many times the things we're tempted to do, we're tempted by ourselves. And having people around that are encouraging and helpful and supportive can really be a great help. One way of escape <laughs> is to run. That's right. I mean, that sounds cowardly, right? But in fact, God says that's literally how you deal with lust. He says, flee it. Flee lust. Take off, you know. Sometimes you're just running away is the best answer. Um, we see this in Joseph, uh, the Old Testament story of Joseph, where the Potiphar's wife was after him. And what did he do? Just ran. He just took off. Um, so here's the thing. What, what, whatever happens when we don't, you know, yield to, uh, or what happens when we don't use one of those ways of escape? Well, we yield to temptation. That's what happens. We fall into that temptation. But um but Jesus never said that God will give us more in our lives than we can handle. You know what we do find in Scripture? We do find that story after story after story, situation, people in the Bible who actually went through things that were too big for them, that were too overwhelming, that were just too much. And sometimes God does that, where he literally gives us more than we can handle. We see that in the Old Testament book of Judges, where um, Gideon, was a judge. And God said to him, he goes, I want you to lead my army. And Gideon says, me? I'm going to lead an army? Are you kidding? I, I am the weakest in my entire family. And my family's the weakest in the clan. And our clan's the weakest in the tribe. You know, a, kind of an inferiority complex, you know, poor Gideon had. But um, he says, Lord, I don't have what it takes to do what you're asking me to do. You're asking me to be a warrior and that's just not me. And of course, God used him mightily. Um, God used him in a way that was even more mighty than if he had said, hey, good, God, I got this, no problem. See, when God even uh, directed Esther in the Bible, she literally was facing the possibility of death. And she just, you know, in her, in her brave trust of God, you know, knew that she wasn't enough. She was a woman in a man's world, and she was literally walking into a situation where it could have just very quickly ended her life, and yet she, she, it was too much. It was too much for her, and yet God did something fantastic because she was willing to lead. Let, let's consider Moses. We'll just, uh, in a couple situations. Here, God asked Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, and when God approached him, Moses said, are you kidding? I can't speak. I can't lead. I am so inadequate. And, you know, that was perfect because God said that you're just the person I want because then you'll have to rely on me. And through Moses, I mean, God used him to do some wonderful things. He provided water for the people. Of course, he delivered them out of Egypt, but got, they, water, they didn't have any water. They provided water. Manna had no food. Manna came down from heaven. 
I've often would have loved to have had that recipe. Can you imagine one food that could provide all the nutrients you would need? But, but after eating that same thing over and over and over, finally the people started griping about it. And they go, you know, we want meat, you know, and um, we're sick of manna. And so Moses asks the Lord, he says in Numbers chapter 11, verse 13, where can I get meat for these people? They keep wailing to me. <laughs> Some of you parents may feel this way. Give us meat to eat. And then look what he says. In verse 14, he says, I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. It's just too much. And, and, and here's the truth that we need to understand, not just from Moses, but from all of us. In our lives, God will often allow you to have more than you can handle. Absolutely, that's true. He will allow you to have more than you can handle. But here's something else we also need to understand is that God will sometimes do do what he did in the life of Moses and he'll give us the gift of too much. Now, it doesn't sound like a gift. It sounds more like a burden, doesn't it? You know, how how too much was it for Moses? Well, look at Moses' conversation with God. In verse 15 of Numbers 11, he says, If this is how you're going to treat me, Please go ahead and kill me if I have found favor in your eyes. He says, you, know, uh, you, you ever felt like that? You know, just, oh, well, just put me out of my misery. He goes, and do not let my face, l- let me face my own ruin. He's saying, this job's going to kill me anyway. I'm trying to leave these people, I'm, I'm dead anyway. So why don't you just help me out here uh, and put me out of my misery right now? Um, and, you know, God doesn't get mad at him. God doesn't say, how dare you talk to me that way? No. Look what the Lord says. The Lord said to Moses, Bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Have them come to the tent of meeting that they may stand there with you. I will come down and speak with you there. And I will take some of the power of the spirit that is on you and put it on them. And by the way, you don't cut the spirit up in pieces like a pie. Uh, He's just saying, I'm going to take some of that responsibility. My, My spirit's going to go on them as well. But he says, they will share the burden of the people with you so that you will not have to carry it alone. The truth is, God will sometimes and often allow us to have more than we can handle. And he'll give us this gift of too much, if I can put it that way, in order to teach us some lessons. And so uh, here they are, just just a few of them. God's gift of too much teaches us, first of all, it teaches us to put something down. Um, when we have too much, it teaches us to prioritize. Many of you have so many pressures on you, especially in light of all that's going on in our world right now. And, and it just forces you to say, hey, what's more important? Some of you are juggling you know, parenting and trying to get their kids in school and in your home and also juggling work. And it's just, it's just way too much. And it's really making you say, what is most important? God wants to help you know what is most important in your life. There were two sisters and a brother that that Jesus was very close to, close friends with. uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, very close close friends and he loved being with them and you know having meals with them and so forth and one time the scripture records that one time Jesus was there with Mary and Martha and Lazarus and they're all talking and chatting and and Martha's just busy she's she's kind of the worry wart in the group and she's getting everything ready and the house all straightened and all of that and she's making sure the meal's just perfect and and she's scurrying around and Mary's just sitting there talking to Jesus And Mary gets, uh, uh, pardon me, uh, Martha gets frustrated with Mary. And she comes over to Jesus. Martha says says to Jesus, she goes, would you tell Mary to help me out here? I mean, I'm doing this whole thing by myself. And uh, and Jesus, and he loves them. So I I picture him, you know, kind of of smiling when he says this. But in, in Luke chapter 10, verse 41, it says, Martha, Martha, the Lord said, you are worried and upset about many things. I think this is probably a characteristic of hers, right? But few things are needed, or indeed only one. He says, I'm going to tell you the most important thing right now. He's talking about priorities here. He said, Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. It's like Mary... I mean, he says, he says to Martha, you're making a nice meal. We all appreciate it. You know, I know you're working hard, but look, we're all going to get hungry again. <laughs> and and we, while we appreciate this meal, you know, Mary realizes that I'm not going to be around forever. I'm not going to be around, you know, I'm got a, I've got a plan here. And so um, he, she's just choosing that best thing for right now. A meal isn't a bad thing. 
It's not a terrible thing. It's just that Mary's picked the best thing. Yeah, we're all hungry. But really, having this time to, to talk, this is the most important thing. And um, this is something that can't be replaced. He wasn't trying to make Martha feel bad. He was just trying to help her see that perspective. See, God uses too much in our lives sometimes to teach us. Really, or instead of and. He wants us to say or sometimes instead of and. Those of you who know me the best know I hate saying no to people. Uh, if somebody wants something or wants some help, I, I really, I just pile it on and I just don't let people know. But, uh, but sometimes God wants us to pick or instead of and. I, 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 again, I'm the kind of person, my personality is that, you know, hey, just add it on. It's, it's never too much. And most of us do. We take on too much. We take on uh, too, not just physical tasks and so forth, but we take on too much debt. We take on even too much emotional burden. Um, we try to squeeze too much into a little ba- bit of time. And we end up spending our time instead of investing our time. Even, even as parents, sometimes we get our kids involved in too much. We don't want them to miss out on anything. So what do we do? We just give them more and more and more and more until finally they're not really even enjoying all of the stuff that we've planned and scheduled into their lives because it's just so much. I think, you know, a lot of us have a to-do list. I think that God would also have us have a to-don't list. Maybe there's some things that aren't necessarily bad, not, aren't evil, wicked things. Um, if there are some evil, wicked things, you can put those on your don't list. But just some things you say, you know what, it's not as important as other things. The second gift, or the second lesson in this gift of too much, if we're going to call it that, is really not just, you know, just um, when, when, when he talks about, you know, putting something down, but handing something off. See, Moses leads the people, and it's completely overwhelming. People are coming to him. The scripture records that people are coming to him night and day. They're, they've got problems. They want his, uh, his counsel and his advice. They want him to solve problems. They want him to make decisions. They want him to settle arguments. All of these things are going on. And the problem is, is that there's two million people. That's right. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands of people. Scholars say it could be as many as two million people. I remember when I first got to Hillside, uh, you know, 30, wow, 31 years ago. I remember when I first got there, other pastors in the area found out that I did counseling. And so they sent their people to to Hillside to, to get counseling. Well, I didn't know who were Hillside people and who weren't. So anybody who called me and said, hey, can I have an appointment for counseling? I just, I just let them. And it got piled on and piled on and piled on. And I'll never forget, I'd gotten an eight-week period of time where I wasn't home one single night and I was closing up a counseling session and the phone rang at the church and um, I answered the the phone and I said Hillside Church and and it was it was Cindy and she said yes I'd like to make an appointment with the pastor and I said well what what seems to be the problem and she said well I'm separated from my husband well eight weeks not being home finally I mean I had to make some adjustments obviously just like Moses is about to because it was just too much I just couldn't handle it all and Moses situation was obviously much worse I didn't have two million people to 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 you know deal with but um, but Jethro and I don't mean the Beverly Hillbilly but Jethro Moses's father-in-law says to him in Exodus chapter 18 verse 17 he says Moses's father-in-law replied, what you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. See, I know he's probably seen the line. So it's not only Moses, but you know, people are sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. And then his father-in-law gives him some fantastic advice. He says, listen now to me and I will give you some advice. And may God be with you. Kind of like, and bless your heart if you don't obey this, you know. Um, You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. So, hey, talk to God more about these problems. Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. So instead of just spoon feeding them, teach them what's right and wrong in God's sight. 
He says, but select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain. In other words, you know, they're not going to slide some money under the table so that you kind of lean the decision their way. You know, some people with some integrity. And, in point, and appoint them as officials over thousands, over hundreds, over fifties, and over tens. So people have different leadership abilities. So, you know, put them in where they, where they can lead best. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times. But have them bring every difficult case to you. This is brilliant. He says, the simple cases, they can decide themselves. They will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. Some of you, you you just learned something about your work situation, right? Especially if you've got a lot of people working under you. You know, sometimes some of the situations are just simple. Let somebody else solve those problems. You solve the difficult ones, the ones that are really complicated, the ones where they have tried to solve and they can't solve them. And that's exactly what Moses did. He now, he only was looking at those situations and handling those problems that only he could solve. That's just what Moses did. Just that he took Jethro's advice and and he did that. And it probably saved his life. Um, And here's the thing. God did not design us to do it all. God often gives us the gift of too much to teach us to put something down and then to hand something off. The problem is, is that too many of you, if you're like me, (laughs) I hope you're not like me. You know, we're just too too full of pride and stubbornness to, to, to actually do that. This doesn't just apply again to physical things. It, it applies that, but, but, but and, and not just to work, you know, our employment, but emotional burdens too. Um, I mean, one of the best things that some of you can do, because you've been carrying loneliness and depression and, and just the emotional weight of even this pandemic, one of the best things you could do is to have somebody that you could call, somebody that you can stand 10 feet away from and, and be able to talk to and just confide in, somebody safe that you can unload, or maybe even better yet, to, a, a a counselor that you can go to and get some good help that way. We are made in a way that God says you can't carry it alone. That's what it is. And it's hard for us because we want to appear strong. We want to appear like we've got it all together. You know, God even says, and we usually use this in the context of worshiping, but he says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm right there in the midst. There's a special power. There's a special thing that happens when a couple of people are together encouraging each other. So we put something down, we hand something off, and then third, we give something to God. Now, maybe you don't feel very close to God. Maybe you say, I don't even know if I really, I don't even think I really have a relationship with God. Maybe you feel like you failed God. Let me just tell you, some of the most wonderful, amazing people, um, some of the most amazing followers of God have failed miserably. Think of King David. I mean, he, he's like a Bible hero, right? I mean, slaying giants and being a, you know, the military man, the captain, all, the, all this, the king of the armies. I mean, he's just like so amazing. And yet he blew it. In fact, when we see what caused him to have more than he could handle, it was something he caused for himself. Maybe you have that. Maybe you have a regret. Maybe you have something that you've done. And you say, hey, it's just, this isn't something God's given me. This is something I put on myself. So I just have to live with it. And that's not true at all. You see, when David's guilt of murder and adultery, when when that, and that's what he did, he committed murder and committed adultery. When that caught up to him, he said this in Psalm 38, verse 4. He says, my guilt overwhelms me. It is a burden too heavy to bear. Have you ever felt like that? I've had times when I've felt like that. Maybe with whatever you've had happen in your life, or you say, I did it to myself. That's what Dave, that's where David is. And he says in verse 8, I am exhausted and completely crushed. My groans come from an anguished heart. He says, I don't have what it takes to handle this. Yes, I did this to myself. But, you know, look, I, I, but what I've done to myself is too much to take. And when I say give something to God, I'm not saying, hey, give him money, give him a bunch of stuff because you have to try and pay him back and God's done so much for you, so you owe him. No, no, you know what? I, it's, it's much bigger and better than that. What I'm sharing is that God invites you to give him your burdens, to give him that, that weight on you. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Do you feel overwhelmed? 
Can I encourage you? Even Jesus felt overwhelmed. Even Jesus, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, looking ahead to what he was going to endure for us, you know, that he was going to die and be buried and rise again, the beating he was going to take, all of that. Mark's Gospel records Jesus' words when he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, anticipating all of this the next day. He says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Have you been overwhelmed to the point of death? You know, sorrow, you just couldn't take your broken heart? See, with everything in me, I, 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 all my, especially early in my life, I wanted to be so strong for my wife and so strong for my kids, and so strong for the church and so strong for my friends and just, you know, be really tough and just, you know, have it all and just be able to take anything. And, and God says, I, that's not what I want for you. That doesn't even help people as much as it is when when you say, God, I don't have enough power, when I'm willing to, to see that I am weak and that I do need him. See, that's when God uses us the most, when, we're, when we come to him and we say, oh, I just can't, I can't do it anymore. For those of you that are under heaviness and you're under pressure in your life right now, and you feel like you just don't have what it takes, I want to encourage you again and show you that, hey, God never says, not that you know, he's going to give you, you know, he's not going to give you more than you can handle. Life is going to give you more than you can handle. And there's a couple of very important reasons why God will occasionally allow us to have more than we can handle. Why? Why would he do that? Why would he allow us to have more than we can handle? Because one, I believe that there are times, number one, I believe that he wants to teach us to depend on his presence. Have you ever noticed that when things are going really well, that, um, we tend to kind of take for granted that God's around. I mean, it's not that we forget completely that he's around, but we just don't recognize as much that we really, really need him, that we're desperate for him. Uh, we don't feel that urgent need to just cry out to him and, 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 and just hang on tight to him, you know. Uh, then things start turning and things get rough, life gets hard, and then we start saying, oh Lord, now I need you. Yes, now I need you. Some, some of you... Um, get quite spiritual when you get on an airplane. Uh, you, don't got, you don't like flying, so you, well, you get quite spiritual. And what I mean by that is you start praying and confessing sin and depending on God like your life depended on it, right? And that's without turbulence. Put in some turbulence and oh my goodness, it's like a whole revival. Um, I remember very distinctly two flights when I was in college, going back to the East Coast. Now, I've been in a lot of turbulence over the years in, in airplane flights, but never like these two particular flights. Um, both of them were all nighters. So it, was, it was the middle of the night, and the tur it was just gut-wrenching turbulence, and it seemed like it was not only severe, but it seemed like it went on for hours and hours and hours. And, you know, I'm convinced, I was thinking of people, because I like flying, but I was thinking of other people around me, and I could look as I was looking around at people, and it was nighttime, so they may have been sleeping, but they also may have been praying. And I was thinking to myself, I remember thinking, I bet there were people who may have even walked on this flight, angry atheists. But, you know, by the time they get off, they're going to be, you know, telling God they'll be missionaries for the rest of their life, you know, <laughs> because why? Wow, when we're in turbulence, when we're in difficulties, when we're in problems, suddenly we want God right there. I've, I've had friends, and I'm not trying to criticize anybody, but I've had people that say, hey, I don't believe in God, or, you know, I don't really need any of that. And, um, and then they have something happen in their life, maybe to them or to someone, and then suddenly they want me to pray. I mean, there's something about the C word, the word, you know, cancer, that people suddenly, hey, I don't believe in God, but just shoot up a prayer for me anyway, would you? And, um, and there's something about it that draws us to God. Back in July and August, we did a series looking at the book of Jonah, a great story. And God told the prophet Jonah, he goes, I want you to go and I want you to preach to the Ninevites and tell them that, you know, that they are to repent and so forth. And, and Jonah says, I don't like the Ninevites. They are horrible people. And so no thanks. So he got on a boat with the opposite direction. Well, God causes a storm to come, a great fish swallows Jonah, and, um, <laughs> and Jonah's inside the fish, and we read what his prayer was. And in Jonah chapter 2, verse 2, he said, In my distress, I call to the Lord. Notice not a lot of people say, In my success, I call to the Lord. <laughs> he says, In my distress, I called to the Lord. And he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. 
When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Some of you are in emotional distress. Some of you are in physical pain. Some of you are in spiritual anguish. And, and, and here's a challenge for many of us. We get into the middle of a storm and then we wonder about God. Where is God? You know, hey, life isn't going the way it should. Um, I even prayed and it's going the opposite of what I prayed about. I mean, if God's so great and so loving and so powerful, how come it's going, you know, very, very different? Like God, God must not be with me because if he w- was with me, then things would be going differently. So, it, you know, God's supposed to be good. Why does this not look so good? And, and I don't think God's even around. So that's what we try, uh, really struggle with. But let me just say, never let the presence of a storm cause you to doubt the presence of God. Just because there's a storm. God has promised, he said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. God might be allowing you to experience just more than you can handle in order that you will call on him. In Nahum 1.7, it says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. So never, don't let the presence of a storm in your life make you come to the conclusion that God's not around. He is present. Yes, there may be a storm present, but he is also present. And if you're in trouble, hardship, distress, depression, you're feeling lonely, he wants you to know that strength, that he wants you to take refuge in him. Yes, we can experience God when things are going well, and and I hope we do. Um, but I think we especially learn and appreciate the goodness of God in hard times. Very famous Psalm, Psalm 23, right in the middle of it, it says, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. I, I've been through some very very, very dark valleys in my life. And I, I just have to tell you from experience, I'd rather be in the valley with Jesus than just be on the mountaintop without him. If you're walking through a safe neighborhood and it's all well lit and everything, and you have a friend with you, that's wonderful, right? But if you're going through a very dangerous neighborhood, it's not well lit, it's the middle of the night, and you have a nice, big, strong friend with you, you appreciate that at a whole nother level, don't you? Having that person there with you. God is with us in our hard times. Life is hard, and even more than than you can handle, God just knows that if we will take and depend on Him, He will let His presence be known with us. Depend on His presence. That's one of the reasons why He allows us to go through too much. Another one is not only that he wants us to go through his presence uh, uh, and uh, experience his presence, he wants us to learn how we can experience his power in our life. And that's the second thing. We can experience his power. That's the second reason. God wants us to experience his supernatural power. You know why? Because most of us try to live our lives on our own, uh, you know, doing our own thing. Um, Just kind of calling the shots. Now, men, I'll pick on the men since I'm a man. But uh, guys, have you ever been doing something or lifting something or whatever? And some other guy comes along and says, hey, you got that? You want some help with that? And you go, hey, no, I've got it. No problem. When you know you didn't have it and there was a problem. Um, They have, of course, they have whole YouTube channels, I think, based on this. I think it's something under the name of something like, you know, uh, why women live longer than men, <laughs> you know, and it's, a, you know, video after video of us doing stupid stuff or things that we think we've got. Um, see, my struggle has always been this attitude, and I, I think I was a kid when I heard it, and you could probably finish it. If you want something done right, you have to do it yourself. If you want something done right, you got to do it yourself. You know, um, I've heard people say that and I've said it many times. But here's our problem. Our biggest problems happen when we have that attitude toward God. Hey, God, it's okay. I got this. No problem. Um, you don't need to get involved. I, 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 everything's fine. And one of the reasons why I think we do that is because we're programmed with this lie that we think that God doesn't give us more than we can handle. See? And if we... And if God's not going to give us more than we can handle, then we should, you know, suck it up and take it. And we've got the strength and, you know, we just hold on and and whatever life throws at us, we've got it. Why? Because God will never give us more than we can handle. So, you know, if he's just around, no, God will give us at times much more than we can handle. And we weren't created to live life without God. 
We really weren't. We were created by God to be desperate for Him, to want Him, to fellowship with Him. And He wants us to experience and enjoy His power in our life. Um, When life gets hard, the Apostle Paul, right? Talk about famous people. Uh, The Apostle Paul, he had something in his life that he identified as a thorn in the flesh. Scholars talk about what it was. We don't know what it was. Um, People have theories about what it could have been. But what we do know is that it was something that was really a burden to him, something that was bothersome to him, something that he really disliked very much because he prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed that it would be taken away. He had seasons of prayer where just, God, please take this away. And God didn't take it away. You know, most of us will have some kind of thorn in our life. Maybe you have one right now. As soon as I give that illustration, immediately you thought of it. Um, We'll have something in our life we want to take away. It might not be something physical. It might be a a relationship thorn. It might be a a job thorn, a financial thorn, some kind of thorn. You just think it's there and God, you know, and we want God to change it or remove it or whatever. It just won't go away. It might be an emotion. You say, I'm so depressed. I wish God would remove this thorn. But you know, Think about it. If God was going to to answer anybody's prayer, you'd think it would be the Apostle Paul, right? Um, You know, hey, some of us have prayed some pretty intense prayers. Some of you have prayed. Pray for your children. Lord, would you please take my my child's headaches away? And can't you fix my marriage? And can't you turn my my teenager back and bring them back and get them off drugs? And Lord, please, can't you just, for one month, can I just not be in financial debt? And you, you, just so many things. You think, God, can't you do this? Can't you fix it? And God can. So why doesn't he? You know, this is more than I can handle. This is how Paul felt. And God spoke to Paul. And he, what he told Paul, he tells us. It's, it's, it's what he would tell us. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he said this. But he said to me, my grace, God speaking, my grace is sufficient for you for my power, my power, my power is made perfect in weakness. God says, my grace is what you need, Paul. When you're weak, that's when my power is really complete in you. So then Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Isn't that incredible? Paul says, thank God I'm weak. (laughs) He says, I delight in this hard stuff because when I don't have what it takes, I can tap into the power that God makes available and, and that goes beyond all human strength. And ability, and I have a supernatural power from God to be able to go through life. The very spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is in my life and is helping me, you know, deal with all this. When I'm weak, that's when God shows Himself the strongest. You see, in our life, it's kind of like if I were to use an analogy of, of of boats. It's kind of like the difference between rowing and sailing. See, we think if God won't give us more than we can handle. Then, that's, then we just have to row. We have to row hard. We have to keep moving. And we're just rowing and rowing. And we're make, trying to move ahead and so forth. But, but see, God does give us more than we can handle. Life does give us more than we can handle. And then relying on God doesn't mean that we're not involved. But it's like throwing up the sail. And letting the wind of God's spirit just bring movement. Instead of us trying to row, 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 row as hard as we can, you know. I serve a God that when I cannot get it done, He can get it done through me. And that's the same for you as well. When I'm weak, He is strong. When God calls you to do something outside of yourself, let me just tell you, He's going to ask you to do something bigger than you. It's going to be bigger than you can handle. I mean, just think about things in life. If if you have a child, <laughs> you suddenly have more than you can handle. If you're a foster parent, if you adopt a child, um, you have more than you can handle. If you have teenagers, you've got more than you can handle. Um, if you decide to serve God with your life, you've got more than you can handle. If you get married, you've got more than you can handle. Um, if you're a single parent, you've got much more than you can handle. Hey, if you're single in this world, I'm telling you, the pressures, the difficult, I tell you, that's hard. You've got more than you can handle. And you weren't created to do life alone. God is with you. And instead of saying, hey, I've got it. I've got to be strong. I've got to suck it up. You know, don't let anybody see that, you know, I'm suffering. No, no, instead of that, you say, I have to be weak. I have to depend on God. 
And I'm not saying go around and act like you're pathetic. <laughs> Maybe you feel pathetic. I've, I have felt pathetic at times. But look, you just say, I can't do life myself. When I am weak, when, then his strength is made perfect through me. Why would God allow you to go through more than you can handle? Maybe it's because he wants to draw you close to a personal relationship with him. Maybe he wants to reveal his presence to you. Maybe he wants you to experience his supernatural power so that you don't stand back and say, wow, look what I've accomplished. But you look back and you say, wow, look what God did in me. Look what God did through me. And, you're, and you just rejoice in that. As we close, I want to share with you something. It's the most important thing, and it really ties all this. It's the most important thing that no one can handle. It's way too much. God knows that. God knows none of us can handle this. The Bible makes it very clear that all of us are in the same situation before God. Every single one of us is born with a sin nature. We have a default setting to be selfish. We have a default setting to do what we want to do. Okay? I'm saying you're not nice people. I'm just saying we all have that. Uh, and I'm not being judgmental. We have all sinned. I'm in the same boat with everybody else. We've all sinned, and we've missed God's perfect mark of perfection. Now, again, I think many of you watching, you're probably all nice people. You're all good people. But you would probably all admit, right, none of us is perfect. Well, you say, well, of course, none of us is perfect. Now, if you believe in God, maybe you're still struggling with that, but if you believe in God, you probably believe in a perfect God, right? So we're not perfect. God is perfect. And that makes a broken relationship. God can't let imperfection into his presence. God can't let imperfection into his heaven. So, you know, so now what do we do? Well, God solved the problem because we couldn't solve it ourselves. It was too much for us to handle. God sent his son, Jesus. The son of God came and he lived his life he showed us what God is like and he, was, and he died for us on the cross and he was buried and he rose again. Why? Because he did something we couldn't do for ourselves. See, us trying to save ourselves, us trying to forgive our own sin, it would be kind of like a drowning man trying to rescue himself. <laughs> just, it, just, it doesn't happen. This is too deep. This is too wide. This problem is too eternal for anyone to be able to handle and that's why God came in the form of Jesus and he died for us, was buried and rose again. And he wants to pay for all of your sin, all of your sin past, all of your sin present, all of your sin in the future. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. We just trust him. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. We, nobody can brag. Nobody in heaven's bragging. Well, you know how I got here? I was so good. I don't care if it's Billy Graham or Mother Teresa or whoever. No one can brag. Why? Because it's by grace through faith. It's because of what Jesus did. And I don't care how good a person might be. No one can be good enough to pay for their own sin. Salvation, though, good news, is a gift from God. God offers it. And frankly, it's just, it's our choice. He offers it as a gift. How? Through faith, through trusting him. It's not what we do. It's not some kind of good deeds. It's not trying real hard. You're not rowing, rowing. Row. No, it's just accepting it as a free gift. And today as we close, maybe, maybe you could see through that illustration that, hey, you say, hey, I, I realize I'm not a Christian. I realize I've never given my life to God. I've never accepted Christ as my savior. And I really need to. I've been trying to do it myself or just be good. And, and, and you should try to be good. That's wonderful. But, but none of us makes it into God's family that way. No one is assured of heaven that way. It's a gift that God gives. And anyone who comes to him, he promises to save. As we close today, you know, I want to give you an opportunity just to take that step of faith there's nothing magical. There's no magical prayer or there's no, you know, routine or ritual that you have to go through. It's really a decision of your heart. And I, when I accepted Christ, I said a prayer and the prayer was really my expression to God that I'm placing my faith in him. 
And I'm going to invite you to say a prayer along with me, similar to what I prayed when I accepted Christ. And I'm going to pray this prayer. And I'll display it here on the screen. And just follow along if you would like. I know I've been doing, I've been doing this every week since we started. And maybe you've never done this, or maybe you did it long ago. If you have already prayed this prayer, you might pray for those who are praying it for the very first time. But if you're not sure that you know for certain you're in God's family, I invite you to pray along with me now. Would you? Dear God, today I come in faith asking you to save me. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die in my place, to be buried and to rise again for me. I ask you to forgive all my sin. Today I want that assurance and peace that you offer through Jesus. Please come into my life and make me your child. I accept you as my Savior today. Help me live for you and thank you for your gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer just now, would you let me know? You could just private message me. I, you know, I, nobody else will know. It'll just be me. You could do it on Facebook or, or whatever. Um, if you have no way of getting hold of me, you can go to hillsidecares.org, the website. You can send an email. And I would love to connect with you or send you information. Um, if you just prayed that, I'd love to you know, get you material or things that you might want to read. Maybe you're thinking about this. You say, David, I've heard you talk about this, but I'm just, you know, I don't know. Uh, hey, I, I'd be glad to give you and send you materials. I could email them to you, you know, whatever, mail them to you, whatever is great for you, you know. Uh, I just want to be of help to you and encouragement to you. And I, I appreciate so much. Um, just, I, I want you to know, as this Thanksgiving uh, approaches, one of the things I'm very, very thankful for is for all of you. I'm so grateful. It's, um, you know, during this pandemic, I I suddenly thought, wow, you know, am I going to be, irrelevant and my, you know, my, my life just going to kind of be useless. And, and you have been such an encouragement to me, letting me know that these messages have been a help. And I hope that they, I, we can just continue to do this. I don't know how much longer we're going to be. As you know, we are in the purple. And so that means that church cannot meet. Um, we were really hoping to meet, you know, uh, at the end of November here. In fact, the 29th was our kind of our goal, but um, that's just not going to be able to happen. And uh, so let's be praying. Realize, hey, the church isn't a building. The church is us. The church is people. So let's be the church as much as we can. Encourage people, help people, do whatever you can. And um, I hope that you'll meet each week here online as we encourage each other. And I am so grateful again for this opportunity for us to have this time. I want to just say happy Thanksgiving to all of you. Um, I hope that you have a wonderful time. I know it's going to look different. Probably be fewer people than you originally would like to have. But um, I hope that you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And I just think want to say thank you for the blessing that you are to me each week. Hey, I look forward to connecting with you again next week as we look again at another statement that Jesus never said. I look forward to seeing you. God bless.